So welcome back for uh, the second talk of the afternoon. Um, uh, Giuseppe Lavagetto, we will talk uh, about uh, testing and production. Ciao Giuseppe, welcome back. Uh, we met uh, last year, uh, am I right? Yeah. And um, you work for Wikipedia? Yeah, the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the organization Wikimedia. that okay. runs the infrastructure for Wikipedia, yes. Okay, and I give you the, the, the virtual microphone and uh, let's uh, start. Let's do it. Hello, everybody. Today I'm here to talk to you about a somewhat taboo topic, which is testing in production. Before I start, I want to give a shout out to my colleague Effie, who has worked on most of the stuff that I will present here today with me, and who's already presented some of this material elsewhere. But let's start. Um, as I said, I'm here to talk to you about testing in production. And be advised, I advocate it's a good thing. Now, the goal, is to, the goal of this talk is to try to convince you that it's a good idea too. Before we start, I'll put forward a disclaimer. Um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything when I talk about the things we do in my organization. Contrary to what most people do when they're on stage, uh, I'll try to present you with a realistic view of the good and the bad of what we do, um, even if I'm ashamed about it. But let's get to what we're talking about. So first of all, um, I'll show you that everybody tests in production, whether they like it or not. I explain why I think we shouldn't escape it and some basic techniques to do uh, this kind of testing. <clears throat> I conclude by telling you how we switched the interpreter for PHP in production uh, for Wikipedia and how we managed to uh, do it without most users noticing a thing. Basically, by deliberately testing in production. So, um, I guess there is some eyebrows when I said testing in production is a good thing. And I think that's tied to the perception, to the stigma associated with the term. After all, let's be real. We've all seen an uncountable number of memes which go from ones like this one, which is just derogatory, to, well, I have to put it, dumbly macho and derogatory, to others like this one that's simply mocking uh, testing in production, linking it to setting the house on fire. Now, I could go down for basically the whole presentation showing you how testing in production is generally mocked, make, make jokes about, considered amateurish and unprofessional. It seems to be the popular opinion and the recurring joke that testing in production is just the, the last thing you should, you should really do. Truth is, all those memes and all these convictions have one thing in common. They assume that you're only testing in production. That's a big difference. But at the same time, this kind of mockery casts a dark shadow on the idea itself. There is thankfully a mounting resistance to this mentality. <clears throat> now, in a pre-pandemic era, at this point of talk, my plan was to just ask, let's go with a show of hands, how many of you test in production? And I am pretty sure that most people would deny instinctively doing it. But let's think about it for a second. How many of you ever roll back procedure for when you deploy stuff in production? And now, raise your hand. And now I think that if we were in person, I would see a notion of raised hands. Or at least I hoped I hope that would be the case. Now, frankly, this means one thing and one thing only. It means you're testing things in production, whether you like it or not. You're not 100% sure that what you're releasing in production works. You're going to see how it goes, and then you're going to know back if something goes wrong. And it means just that even if you have full code coverage in unit tests, even if you have extensive end-to-end -end tests, there are always weird situations you didn't count or couldn't test through before. 
That's because perfect testing requires at least the same amount of resources as running your production site. And we'll go back to this later. But basically, for most companies, for most organizations, this makes no economical or practical sense. So if this is true, uh, what should we do about it? Well, we should embrace it. That's my point. You, you're, you're testing in production anyways, so you should just be aware of it. And you should use it to your advantage and to your user advantage. You should just uh, invest the time and resources in making your testing in production safer and automated. Now, I can imagine some of you are still resisting the idea that testing in production is unavoidable. Let's see why, at least for a uh, high traffic, high development uh, based website. So first of all, let's be real. I've worked in this industry for enough years now to uh, think that my experience is somewhat representative. And I have to say, I've never seen a company with more than five years of life who didn't have the staging problem in one form or another. Um, What's the staging problem? The problem is that keeping a second differently but similarly configured environment <clears throat> for pre-production testing is expensive and not all company invest the adequate amount of human resources into it. By my estimate, you need um, more than 20% of your developers every time to, to dedicate to this environment to keep it uh, on par with the main one most of the time. And you need a sizable fraction of your production infrastructure as well. Even you want to be able to duplicate all data, but also you want to be to replicate a good portion of your traffic. And you need people or processes to look after those. It's doable, but it's not easy nor cheap. I've come to believe, honestly, over the years that a good release strategy beats having a complete staging environment. To be clear, unless you have a mirror infrastructure on which you test the next version of your software for an extended period of time, when you expose your code to production traffic, it will face scale and data challenges. You can't really replicate all the crazy ways your users either break stuff or find out something you're not even looking for that is broken. And of course, stuff happens that nobody thought about. Let me make you an example. So a few years ago, uh, the foundation had to transition uh, from HTTP 2.2 to 2.4. Uh, I was tasked with the transition. Um, there were a ton of small and big changes in the configuration that needed to be um, weeded out. We studied the change log, uh, prepared the code changes that made our configuration compatible with both versions. Of course, with some horrible templates because we are uh, we're all DevOps. Um, and then we had a test fit. Like we did tests. Uh, we, uh, we have hundreds of URLs that we test um, when we make an Apache change. And in this case, we tested basically that the response was the same between Apache 2.2 and 2.4. Now, we were confident in the transition. We make the transition. Everything, like nothing breaks besides keep working. We're all happy. Uh, but a couple of days after the transition is done, uh, and we feel good about the results, right? A mysterious sounding bug gets posted that says that one page on uh, French Wikipedia is unreadable. And specifically, the bug uh, says that the page is uh, outputting some binary garbage. Now, a quick inspection of a page revealed, revealed to me not only that the user was right, I was also seeing that garbage, but that the output looks a lot like some uh, looking at some compressed archive in the terminal when you, by error, use cat instead of zcat. Now, it turns out, after inspection, that a subtle change in how mine types are detected and handled between Apache 2.2 and 2.4 made, made Apache interpret any URL and in dot capital Z as a Unix compressed file. Those Apache would helpfully add the content encoding X compress header to the response, and our CDN would instead just uh, compress the HTML with gzip. Then the browser was told that it was receiving X compressed data, but was receiving gzip data. And the result was, of course, that the browser wasn't able to interpret what it was getting. Now, this is just to show you uh, 
that basically there's always stuff that happens that you can't really properly foresee. Um, now, at the cost of sounding like um, a whiskey advertising telling you to drink responsibly, I think the point should be made that while we all test in production, there are good ways to do so and uh, bad ways to do so. And there are a series of disciplines uh, that you have to follow, in my opinion. It's really nothing, nothing fancy or a long list, but I've seen organizations ignore them all over and over and over. Now, what testing responsibly in production looks like? Well, first of all, you need to know beforehand what you're going to test and, uh, and why. You need to define testing strategy that's respectful of your users. You need to try to reduce the blast radius for them uh, if things catch fire. Going back to the meme that you've seen before, basically uh, that was in responsible testing in production, right? Responsible testing in production means that probably just the barnyard catches fire. Uh, you also need to know how to verify that your test is passing. You need an acceptance uh, criteria. Uh, you not need to define what you're watching and what is the acceptable result. For example, let me make you a simple example. You could say, OK, the 95 percentile of edit save times needs to remain below 800 milliseconds. Perfect. That's a good, uh, a good parameter. You probably want more. And I can stress this enough. If your parameters are not met, you should just roll back immediately. Roll back to a situation where almost no user, or ideally no user, is directly impacted by the issue. Then start debugging it. Um, you might make your life a bit harder this way, but you're saving a lot of headaches to your users. Ideally, this last part, and well, basically everything, should be included in your uh, deployment strategy. Like you, you should have a way to um, tell your deployment system automatically deploy using this technique, we'll see it later, one of these techniques, and if the conditions are not met, automatically roll back. Now, if only we did that at, at my organization right now, um, we don't. We, all these processes are mostly manual. That's because it's, it requires some work to, to automate stuff and we're short on resources. But anyways, um, let's look at, I said that there are common techniques to uh, do the, the releases to responsibly test in production. Let's see uh, these, te these techniques. And let's start with the simplest one, which is canaring. Now, canaring basically means uh, that you release your changes to a portion of your traffic and usually progressively increase, uh, progressively increase it to 100%. Canary is probably the simplest way of performing testing in production. And I think it's used, uh, it's the most used one also. Um, basically, let's say that we have 100 VMs or uh, 1,000 pods, and you just release uh, the new version to a number of them, and you let it run until you're confident that the parameters you set for the upset answer met. Uh, no performance regression, and so on. When that is met, you can just deploy it to everything. Now, given how simple uh, canoring is, uh, it's one of the most used te techniques in testing in production, and we are no strangers to it. Uh, in fact, we regularly use this technique when we need to upgrade something in our um, traffic layer. Now, why we use canoring in that case? Uh, mainly because there's no alternative. Uh, canoring just works on the physical host. You, you don't need to do anything, and it can work at any layer of the OSI stack. Some of the other techniques that I'll show later only work at L7. So they need the application layer. They need to, to interpret the request from the user. And let's see uh, an example of what we do with canaring. Um, we constantly tweak uh, and tune the TNS parameters for our edge caches with the goal of increasing the security and performance for our users. Now, of course, there is um, a problem with this, which is um, there is a lot of people running very, 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 very old clients. And very old clients use uh, typically older versions of uh, TLS connection parameters that are somewhat insecure or less performant. And we don't want to exclude them. 
Now, of course, you have a browser compatibility matrix. For the main browsers, it's very easy to say which ones are going to uh, work with your new settings and which uh, are going to be cut off, although there's a caveat there. Uh, but there are other cases where you don't know. There are other things you don't know. For example, a few years ago, uh, we had to do with the fact that when we removed SSL 3.0 completely in, in insecure, uh, and some ciphers that were not uh, supporting perfect full work secrecy, um, that broke the browser on the Xbox 360. Because yes, apparently people browse Wikipedia with their Xbox. So um, given we want to evaluate the number of users that we actually block compared to what should be on paper, um, what we do is we start rolling out the new changes onto a single server and add the instrumentation to both log and count the connection errors due to the new changes. This allows us to evaluate more precisely how many users will be cut off and, and if any error stands out, basically, and also evaluate the performance impact of the changes and the resource utilization. Um, this is the moment where you usually find out most of the upstream bugs that we didn't find in our testing because we didn't test at scale. Now, once we've done that, uh, we roll out uh, to the world data center uh, where that server was located, meaning that all the users from a certain geographical area will now be served only by the new settings. If the parameters are still acceptable after about a week in this situation, we then move to rolling out, every, uh, rolling out everywhere. Now, I want to stress um, again that this approach is very simple and works at any layer of the stacks, but it's far from ideal. You're testing based on traffic and not users or assets, um, which means that uh, it's very hard to isolate failures um, easily. Now, while this is avoidable for TLS, unavoidable for TLS testing, there are better ways to do uh, our kind of testing. For example, phase rollouts, uh, which means, uh, let's, let's make an example. Let's say that you're uh, an online shop se uh, selling beach apparel. Now, you might probably want to release your new version of the website for the users in Antarctica or Greenland, right? For the, your shop localized in Greenland or in Antarctica, because I guess you're not getting much traffic there. Test that everything is still operating within the parameters, then roll out progressively to the other markets. So basically dividing by market, by website, whatever. Um, please note um, that I'm saying that you should start with the least critical things, which doesn't necessarily mean that they are the least visited, but you should definitely end with the most visited properties because that's where you find the worst scaling problems and you want to verify everything else before the scaling problems show up. Anyways, let's make an example of uh, phase rollouts in something that we do, and it's basically how we roll out new MediaWiki versions. MediaWiki is the software at the center of the wikis. Now, this process is called the train, and basically it means uh, we're dividing wikis in three groups. Group zero, wikis uh, that get, get the, first, uh, the new version first are test wikis, test.wikipedia.org, and so on. By the way, they're public accessible, but they have basically no interesting data in them. Um, and the wiki for wiki software itself, which is mediawiki.org, which is, if you want, a form of extreme dot fugling, the people developing the software uh, experience the effect of what they push to, to, to main first um, than, every, than everybody else. Now, if no serious regressions are noticed in this phase, the next day we roll out to a new version to a select group of wikis, um, including some wikis that could present special issues like Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons. Given the larger scale, another good chunk of issues are found if they're present. And at this point, um, including a good part of fiscality issues. And finally, we add the new version into the rest of the wikis, which constitute more than 80% of our total traffic. Now, Everything in this process is very manual at the moment, and we mostly only stop the process if uh, we have a large number of errors in, 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 uh, <clears throat> and or we find a new kind of fatal error in the logs. We're trying to get better at this, 
uh, we're trying to define acceptance criteria more in more in detail. Honestly, for MediaWiki specifically, since it's a, a monolith, right? Uh, while everything else which we build them as a microservice, uh, MediaWiki is our old monolith that's been um, still developed. And so for a monolith, it's harder to define acceptance criteria because there are so many things. But anyways, the thing that I want to stress is that we do most things manually, but you shouldn't if you can. Like if, if it makes sense in your organization, if your organization has enough resources, manual intervention should be an exception, not the rule. Anyways, this process, this kind of process, phase rollouts are great for changes to your software. But it doesn't work very well if you need to, to do some deeper infrastructural changes. Let's say, for example, you add, um, you move to use Cassandra for key value storage from using Redis. I don't know. I'm, I'm making a, a stupid example, right? These kind of things you can test for Greenland alone easily. So um, the other reason why in situations in which this is not great is if you want to basically you have to test the functionality works on all your entities and not just one because they're not just carbon copies of one another and in these cases you have to do something a bit more extreme which is the infrastructure a testing um, now this means that instead of moving a whole site to the new platform you just send a fraction of your users to the new system this allows you to easily separate the metrics for the two systems without changing code or complicating uh, your metrics extractors, have a much more fine-grained control over how many users are affected in case of test failure, and third, provide a, each user with a consistent user experience. This means that if it will be easier for you to determine beforehand if a bug report has anything to do with infrastructural changes or not. The procedure is not different if you want from a normal A-B test that um, you do at higher levels to uh, change stuff in your website. It's just that it's a different uh, layer of your stack that's involved. Now, this technique um, allows you to test some critical transitions uh, that might have a, a huge blast radius for, for, uh, with very fine grained precision. Um, we've used this technique multiple times, um, but let's take an example of probably the biggest uh, case in which we used it, which is uh, when we had to migrate from HHVM, the virtual machine for PHP uh, created by Facebook, back to ZenPHP. Now, uh, one second of backstory, in 2014 we switched to um, HHVM, um, which gave us enormous advantages. Uh, but sadly, in 2019, Facebook dropped support for uh, PHP, not becoming compatible with PHP 7, and just deciding to push for their own um, PHP flavor, which is called Hack. Now, we have a large install base of people using traditional PHP for MediaWiki, so we couldn't really just tell everybody, get lost, move to HHVM. And so we had to move back to PHP 7. Now, we were changing the language interpreter completely, and at the same time, moving from one major version of language PHP 5 to PHP 7. The change seemed too large and with a lot of unknowns at our scale. And let's see uh, these unknowns specifically. First of all, functionality. Um, we're switching language interpreters. We're switching major versions of the language, as we said. Sure, we have unit tests for that, although not a very great coverage in MediaWiki itself. Uh, and of course, there are subtle changes that cause bugs not caught by unit testing. Let me make you an example of, of, of such a bug. In PHP 7, developers fixed a few bugs with the Unicode tables, uh, which means that MB to upper would now correctly capitalize some uh, Unicode characters that weren't capitalized before. Now, you might remember that any wiki URL for an article has the first letter capitalized. This meant that PHP 5 and HGGM would capitalize with one letter, um, and PHP 7 would capitalize with another letter, meaning that when you try to, to access a page that was created with the old versions of PHP, with a new one, 
that would be inaccessible. <sighs> so, um, you don't really predict such stuff, right? It's not written now, no word in the documentation either. And of course, this is true also for uh, every single PHP extension. They behave differently between the HHVM and uh, PHP 7 in subtle ways and typically not in, in a not documented way. So um, this is not the only problem in terms of functionality. Another one is that, uh, of course, we box the number of resources that every request can take because any, anybody can edit a wiki, right? So we want to limit the amount of resources that one page can consume in terms of CPU time and memory. Now, uh, there are small differences, subtle differences in how much CPU and memory uh, HHVM and PHP 7 use. And if you, we had pages that were near the edge of still being rendered, but at the edge of uh, over overcoming the limits in HHVM, sometimes was would overflow the limits in PHP 7. Editors are very good at working around our, our limitations in terms of resource usage. Um, meaning that they pack as much as they can within the limits of resource usage, and they were clearly very disappointed when a page that they so carefully optimized couldn't work anymore because of a change of interpreter. So that, that's another thing that we had to look out. Um, <clears throat> now, um, let's go to the biggest problem, which is performance. Now. HHVM at the time gave us a huge boost in performance, like 70% uh, less uh, CPU usage, 50% less uh, latency. Incredible, great. And it allowed that you, uh, us to reduce the number of machines we used to, to serve media wiki even at some point while having more stability than before. Now, the big uh, unknown was, has PHP code up any, any? Uh, like? Anecdotal evidence which we get from other people running PHP 7 at scale told us that it did. But what about our code? It's five years that we run everything on HHVM. Maybe we've optimized for it too much. Um, now, benchmarking seems to confirm uh, that performance was on par. But also, we had some big question marks in terms of performance at large scale and under very high concurrency. And that's something that you can only evaluate uh, by loading traffic on, on a server. Now, the last problem we had was even sneakier. Um, HHVM has been built with observability as a centerpiece, and we were able to extract a flurry of metrics from it. Now, from PHP, even with a lot of work, uh, engineering work, we were only able to extract a smaller data set. And, and our big question was, are these new metrics enough to diagnose issues at one time without having to resort to black box debugging? Only debugging things in production could really told, tell us if that was true. Um, now, A-B testing, how we did it? Uh, we did it this way. Uh, for every request from a browser, JavaScript will execute a script that would check and store a random string for one week in the client local storage. Then, based on a configuration value that sets server side, um, we would say uh, another function, another function, a statistical function, would decide if, uh, based on that string, the user was in the sample of people being tested or not. If if they are, it would just set an additional cookie or remove it otherwise. Server side would just direct the user traffic to PHP or HHVM based on that cookie. Now, this approach has a few advantages. Uh, and the most important, I think, is that it keeps the data so that potentially identifying unique ID on the client. But it also allows us to change the percentage of users in the test as a matter of minutes, as we'll see later. So all of this makes the testing kind of secure. We have a quick way to go back and so on. But that's not nearly enough. You need to be able to separate all of your observable based on text on the testing version. So you need to add a tag to all the actions performed within a platform. And the same for goes for all the metrics and all the logs. In order to avoid surprises, um, having to make decisions while you have to decide to roll back or not, and also to avoid tensions with other teams after the rollout, you have to firmly set your XMTASCAL criteria. 
And in our case, it was simple. Uh, what we were requested was just nothing changes. So latency, server side errors, resource consumption would need to be within 5% of what we got from HHVM. Now, uh, all of this is very important. Uh, but the most important thing is be mindful of your users, respect their experience, and respect their ability to choose to help you. To this end, we first allowed our logged in users to actively decide if they wanted to help us test a new interpreter by enabling a beta feature. Do you want to help us debug the new thing? Yes, please click on the beta feature. At the same time, we started ramping up the percentage of anonymous users that would be served by PHP up to 50%. So if you were logged in, you had to choose if you wanted PHP 7 or HHVM. Well, you could choose to use PHP 7. Um, if you were not logged in and your browser would, would accept cookies, uh, we would just extract uh, on which um, part of the infrastructure would go. We increased the percentage of anonymous users progressively to from 1 to 5 to 20 to 50 percent with various rollbacks in various phases when we found new, new problems and new errors. Uh, at that point, when we got to 50 percent, we were confident enough that we are now running also um, the traffic from cookie-less and uh, anonymous users to PHP by default. So. Uh, the default is PHP, and you can be extracted to be on HGVM basically at that point. And only at that point, we would conclude the migration, moving all the, uh, the um, basically removing the test and moving everybody to go to PHP by default, including logged in users. Now, uh, how about the rollout? Um, how we did every step? So, after moving one step further, you would uh, you need to ask yourself um, is the site stable? Are the requirements satisfied? And my suggestion is create a dashboard so that you can visualize that immediately and always await at least one uh, traffic pattern cycle. If your um, traffic is daily, you can wait a day, maybe two, maybe two. And if it's weekly, you probably need to wait a whole week. Now, um, what about the rollback strategy instead? Well, our wikis are heavily cached in the CDN, meaning that most of the time, if you're an anonymous user, you just get um, a cached page from Amsterdam here in Italy uh, instead of uh, your request having to go all the way back to our main data centers in the US. Um, so we took steps to separate the caches uh, seen by the user on PHP and by the users using HHVM because we wanted people to have a consistent experience. Uh, whenever the criteria uh, weren't met, we would just change the configuration variable in the code and go back to the previous step in the rollout of um, PHP 7 to the user. Uh, as I said before, the tactic we adopted allowed us to jump between steps in a matter of minutes if needed. And let me describe it because there are, there are sub, some subtlety that you might not expect. Um, so let's try to visualize the process. A new user with no cookies or local storage set makes a request to our CDN. Um, if a content is not in cache, they will, uh, it will be fetched from the A infrastructure, so the base infrastructure you're, you're, you're moving away from, and cached accordingly. When the user receives the page back, our browser executes JavaScript that, based on a randomly generated bit sequence, sets or removes a cookie. The sets or removes is very important in this case. Let's assume this user has been extracted to be part of a test. What happens on their next request? Uh, that request will contain the USB cookie and will be, first be directed to the cache and infrastructure for the test. Please note that the browser of our user will again check if a user is in the sample at this point. So let's say that between the first request and the second request, we found out that there is some problem on specific pages with, with uh, the infrastructure P. We will have just turned off in server side the sampling to zero for the test. And so the page that the user receives now um, as sampling set to zero, and those the calculation that we talked about before, will just remove a cookie. And any subsequent request that they make to us will go to the infrastructure. So basically, we get one request per user that has been extracted 
when we want to, to, to switch the, the interpreters. Um, now, how this all went, they rolled out to cover all six months. Um, and apart from the preparation work that was basically making MediaWiki uh, work with PHP 7, um, it involved work on six rep code repositories. Um, but we, so it was a pretty complex endeavor. Um, but it never caused the user visible outage or long term service, which I think is a testament to the fact that testing in production uh, proactively is uh, always a good thing. To wrap up, I would say that um, given most of us actually test software in production, we might as well do it properly and programmatically and, it, and treat every production deployment with the same rigor we use for passing CI. There are well-known proven methods to do so, and we should all stop pretending we can do without them. Okay, I'm done advocating for the devil. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, I hope you enjoyed the slides. I'm open for questions now, if you have any. Rieccoci qua. So, um, the, we have a couple of questions. The first one uh, is uh, my own question. So, uh, you, you struggle a lot to, to, to migrate to PHP 7. And uh, PHP 8 uh, is, uh, is uh, right here. So, what's the plan about, uh, about PHP 8? So, uh... I guess it's going to be very similar, um, simpler. Uh, so I expect less surprises, honestly, between uh, different versions of PHP than to, to completely different interpreters. But the idea, uh, the basic idea, is still to um, do the same, the same kind of process. Like, uh, do I be testing uh, with users, asking our loyal users, the ones that logged in, that are logged in, the editors typically. Of a wiki, so the people, the actual community that makes Wikipedia what it is, to help. That's that's always been the the way we've we've done this kind of stuff, um, asking for the help of the community, and at the same time, progressively testing stuff with with care. Uh, just because we can't, we we really can't afford to have to mirror infrastructures, which would be yeah the way to, the way to go if you want to be sure, hundred percent sure that you can do a, a release in a bang and. And that works. Oh. And um, you talk about um, the uh, A-B testing a lot. But uh, what about the privacy implication in doing A-B testing? So uh, if you do traditional A-B testing for the application, usually you just set a cookie that has all the A-B tests that you're doing. I've been in organizations that do tens of A-B tests uh, a day. And you don't really want, you don't really care about Roll, you don't need to roll back on the client in some way because you're not testing infrastructure. Testing your code is much more uh, flexible. In When you're doing this kind of testing, which involves your infrastructure, you need to have a way to set something permanent on the user side. And uh, in our case, it was a random string on the, on the client. The important thing is you, always, you know that that's completely identifying even for people that are not logged into your service. I know not every organization is, is privacy conscious, but if you're privacy conscious, you should uh, take steps to ensure that that kind of uni unique identifier string is not sent, sent back to you unless your user wants to be recognized by you, so logged in or something like that. OK. We don't have any more questions from the, the public, so. Um, I think so are done, but uh, um, I suggest you also to submit to PHP Day or other, uh, other PHP related conference uh, uh, owned by Groups because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the topics is very, very uh, important for the PHP community to learn and improve themselves. Also to, to bring some DevOps uh, knowledge in, uh, develop, in the developer community and uh, thank you uh, again see you um, next time 
Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Uh, I'll be around in the chat if you have questions or want to know anything. Bye. Have a nice rest of the conference. Oh.